This is the second part of my review of the first three Dragon Quest games. Be sure to watch the first one because, as we'll see in this video, understanding the original is vital in appreciating a sequel. So, the first Dragon Quest game. An innovative first entry and a vital piece of RPG history, but not one that's held up very well. But the series obviously didn't stop here, there's over three decades of content under the Dragon Quest banner. So clearly, this game's sequels kept the ball rolling, with a direct successor hitting the Famicom in 1987 and the NES in 1990, and yup, I'm still using the mobile remake with the absurdly narrow screen. Did Dragon Quest II, Luminaries of the Legendary Line, improve and expand on the original like a sequel should? Let's find out. Dragon Quest II takes place a hundred years after the first game, and immediately upon starting it, we get a direct follow-up to Dragon Quest I's ending, in which the hero and Princess Gwalin set out to found their own kingdom. And not only did they accomplish their goal, they were overachievers, founding not one, but three great kingdoms, Middenhall, Kanuk, and Moonbrook, each of them ruled by the descendants of the two founders. But wouldn't you know it, evil began to sweep the land once again this time led by the nefarious Hargan, a servant of a vile and dark power. But not to worry, because this time, the royal heirs of the three great kingdoms are here, and since they're also the descendants of the legendary Erdrick, they're legally obligated to go on adventures and save the world. It's just family tradition at this point. So yeah, not really a whole lot different from the last game. Evil bad guy of the day ruins things, and the descendants of Erdrick must stop him. A simple setup that works. Though seeing some real continuity between the last game and this one is neat, and the conflict is definitely better presented this time, with the forces of Hargan actually shown mercilessly raising Moonbrook to the ground. It's not much, but definitely better than just listening to a king monologuing about what happened. After one wounded Moonbrook soldier warns Middenhall of the danger, the Prince of Middenhall, your standard silent protagonist Dragon Quest hero person, sets out to unite with his two heroic cousins and put an end to Hargan for good. You name this one as per usual, but the names of the Prince of Canuck and the Princess of Moonbrook are actually picked from a random pool of names when you start out. I got Conrad and Linda, so that's what I'm calling them. So, the first task on this journey is finding and joining with the other two royal heroes, and, uh, the opening kind of stinks, honestly. You'll notice immediately that there are multiple combatants in battles this time, which really drags on when there's several of them and one of you. Though, to be fair, I kind of went about the opening mission in the worst way possible. After you search around for a bit, you find out that Conrad went to some sacred spring, and that you should meet with him there. And don't ask me how, but I somehow managed to never find the place at first, no matter how hard I looked. I managed to go in entirely the wrong direction looking for this guy, journeying into stronger monster territory and completing an entire dungeon that, in hindsight, was definitely meant to be explored by two people. This wasn't fun. Level grinding abounded, and I had to slog through battles with one character, and did I mention that Dragon Quest II is well known for being the hardest game in the series? Yeah, doing this part out of order wasn't a good time. And frankly, this opening still would have been a pain, even if I did find the spring earlier, because... Oh joy, Conrad already left by the time I got there, and then I had to go on a wild goose chase just to try to find the guy, and at the end of it, he straight up wasn't where he was supposed to be because he slacked off at an inn on the way there. Ugh, well, that was annoying, but fortunately, getting Linda isn't nearly as bad. Let's talk about the characters for a moment. I really like how they all share equal importance. So many Dragon Quest games, and RPGs in general, have the highly important chosen one special protagonist person and their cool but ultimately less destiny-powered companions. In this one, all three of them are chosen ones, of royal blood and descended from the great Erdrick. Kinda neat. And really, despite being the last one to join the team, Linda kind of felt more like the protagonist than Blue over here, what with being the only one having a personal score to settle with Hargan for torching her kingdom. And all. That being said, the characters themselves are paper thin as far as personality goes. You get the occasional line of dialogue out of them from time to time, but not much in the way of actual character development, sadly. But on the bright side, when you finally have the squad together, it reveals this game's primary improvement to the battle system. That being, well, 
multiple party members. That might be something so basic it's not even thought of much these days, but it was new at the time. And, thanks to it, one of my biggest problems with Dragon Quest 1 is fixed. The battles aren't monotonous button mashers anymore. Each party member brings something unique to the table. The main character is the physically sturdiest, but is the only main hero in the series to have zero aptitude for magic. So I guess he's just pretending to contribute to the final smash. Fortunately, he gets access to the strongest weapons and armor to make up for it. Conrad's weaker physically and is more limited in equipment choices, but can use magic, which makes him a versatile all-rounder. Linda has even less strength and fewer equipment options, but is a devastatingly powerful mage. And it's not just the playable characters that are more interesting in combat, the monsters have upped the ante as well, mostly due to a new system that would stick with the whole series, enemy groups. When a battle starts, you'll see that different monsters are sorted into targetable groups. As you'd expect, dealing with larger groups is harder, but the thing is, you get magic spells that target every enemy within one group. So surprisingly, it can actually be simpler to deal with one really large group of enemies than a scattering of different ones. In the first game, your battle options were attack, heal, sealing magic, putting enemies to sleep, yeah, that was about it. In this game, mindlessly pressing the attack button won't cut it, and you have to use real strategy. Maybe you could use a Dazzle spell to reduce an enemy's accuracy, soften up their defenses with sap, or bolster your own defenses. You have to play to each character's strengths, and carefully target the enemy groups to take them down as efficiently as possible. I'm not trying to say that this game is in some jaw-dropping masterclass of RPG strategy, because it isn't, but compared to the last game? Man, this is an improvement. Also, having multiple party members brings to light one recurring Dragon Quest game mechanic that I just find kind of funny. Whenever a party member runs out of HP, they don't faint or get KO'd, they... Yup, they just straight up kick the bucket and you drag their coffin around with you. Don't worry though, every town in this game has a church dedicated to a nameless goddess, the priests of whom will just casually revive the dead for some pocket change. Clearly, it's more a game mechanic than a facet of the world building, since really, if it was, I could just revive all of Moonbrook by slapping some 20s on the nearest curate, and death would be even more inconsequential than in Dragon Ball. Dragon Quest II handled leveling up way better this time. In the first game, it felt like leveling up was something I had to halt exploration and do before I was allowed to make any progress. In this one, getting stronger is something I did as I was making progress. Helped along nicely by the fact that this game's overworld is way bigger than the last game. This really comes into focus after you acquire your own ship at which point the world is basically your oyster as you scour the globe, checking things off your plot MacGuffin shopping list before facing off against Hargan at the end. Just how much bigger is the world compared to the last game? Well, see that island over there? Yeah, that's the world map of the previous game. You get the old overworld music and everything when you visit. It's not quite as impressive as it sounds, as it's a much simplified version of Alephgard, with only like three points of interest on it, but still, shoving the old world map into a corner of your new one? That is a power move I can respect. Exploring this brave new world is pretty fun, helped along by the fact that the overworld theme, as well as the music in general, is good stuff. I especially love the first overworld theme. It's easily one of my favorite tracks in the series. Too bad it changes when you get all three party members. Alright, so we need to talk about the difficulty for a moment. The game's unquestionably tough. NES difficulty. You'll be fighting hard and often, and you'll definitely need some patience and fortitude to see it through. But bizarrely enough, I somehow managed to die the least often in the second game in the trilogy, despite its reputation as the hardest one. The opening was brutal, don't get me wrong, but after I got the squad together and into decent fighting shape, I honestly had a pretty smooth experience. Like, there's this running gag amongst the fans about the Prince of Kanak being as durable as a wet napkin, and being dead 80% of the time, which is hilarious and I'll gladly go along with it, but it wasn't exactly true in my playthrough. Conrad held his own just fine, I don't get it. I have a few theories regarding why this was, ranked on this scale of likelihood from least to greatest. 
One, I'm awesome at this game and y'all need to get on my level. Two, I think I got really lucky during the open-ended portion of the game with the ship travel. Seriously, I got my butt kicked way harder in Dragon Quest III's equivalent of this stretch of the adventure, thanks to constantly wandering into places I was totally unprepared for. I guess I just so happened to keep going to the right places in the second one. And three, the mobile remake probably did a lot of balancing work. There's the usual stuff, like giving out more experience in gold in battle, but they also made one massive improvement, that being the fast travel system. Fast travel in Dragon Quest is done with a zoom spell or a chimera wing. In the original version of Dragon Quest II, using these just sends you back to your last save point. Oh right, there are multiple save points in this game compared to the one you had last time. In the remake, however, fast traveling works like it does in Dragon Quest III, that being that you can select any town you've been to and warp between them. Honestly, this alone makes the remake so much more forgiving. In the original, you were stuck with the clunky teleportal system. I have to say, the adventure in Dragon Quest II was substantially better than the last one. I'm honestly impressed with how many right choices and improvements were made, even if I was, again, reaching for a guide on a few things. But there's one really noticeable blush on all of it, that being, oh boy, the dungeon designs. They're not so bad early on, but as the game progresses, they develop an unhealthy obsession with giving you way too many wrong ways to go and only one right one. Sure, going off the beaten path will sometimes net you some treasure, but way too many times they lead to time-wasting dead ends. And, of course, I can't talk about the dungeons without mentioning the undisputed worst dungeon in... Maybe all of Dragon Quest, the name of which is sure to inspire war flashbacks to anyone who's played this game. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cave to Renderack. This isn't even the final dungeon. It's the one that leads to the last section of the world. It starts out pretty lousy, with a complicated maze you can only solve through trial and error, but soon enough you will find yourself in this room. Looks unassuming enough, until you take a few steps and what? An invisible pitfall! And now I'm in this massive, empty area which takes forever to get out of with strong monsters hounding me every step of the way. Alright, I'm back out and... Now I'm way at the top of the old room. Guess I'll just head back to- What? Seriously? Okay. Back again? I guess I'll- ANOTHER ONE?! Wait a minute. Those stairs I saw at the start. The stairs at... the bottom of the room with... all the invisible pitfalls. That was the way out, wasn't it? Oh. Oh no! Why? Why? So many pitfalls, so many monsters. Who thought this was a good idea? All you had to do was put little cracks in the ground to show where the pitfalls were, but no! The designers of this dungeon scoff at the petty notion of basic human decency. This isn't even challenging game design. I can take tough monsters or labyrinthian mazes, but this is just plain mean-spirited. Not even the dungeon leading up to the final boss pulls anything nearly this stupid. It took nearly half an hour of my life to reach those stairs. What went wrong here? And it's not even over yet. There's still more of this maze to slog through. But at the very least, the exit isn't that far away. Now where am I? Oh. Just let me out of this cave! In the version I played, nothing in the game after this got nearly as aggravating as this one cave. So, 
I was in the clear after that was over, but that's only because the mobile remake fixed what I assumed to be the single, cruelest design decision ever inflicted on a Dragon Quest game. I never had to deal with it, but just hearing about it gives me terrible anxiety. There's a particular spell that shows up in the game near the end. Full Heal. It does what the name implies, restores HP to the maximum. Seems innocuous, it became a staple advanced healing spell in the series, but there is one thing that you should never, under any circumstance, do with a full heal spell, and that's GIVE IT TO THE FINAL BOSS! After you beat Hargan, you fight Malroth, this big evil god of destruction thing that Hargan was worshipping, and in the original version, they gave this guy full heal, which he can pull out any time he pleases. You could literally be one hit away from victory, and Malroth could just instantly heal all the damage you did. Why? And no, it's not like this was put there to counterbalance an otherwise weak opponent. Malroth has all the destructive power and durability you'd expect of a final boss. You would have needed to be absurdly overleveled and also lucky to beat the original game. Fortunately, for the mobile and thus Switch versions, the developers realized what they'd done and replaced Full Heal with some defense-altering spells, turning Malroth into a tough but reasonable challenge. But my heart goes out to whoever had to face this monstrosity in his original form. So, yeah, between this and the cave to sadistic suffering, I can definitely see why this game is regarded as the hardest in the series. And it's a pity that the game had to end on such a bitter note, because most everything before and after that is great. Well, for the time, anyway. After their conquest over Malroth, the trio take their Dragon Quest post-game victory lap. Linda has one touching farewell with her father's spirit as she vows to rebuild Moonbrook. And when you return home, you're coronated King of Middenhall as the world enjoys its newfound peace. There's no question about which of these two I like more. Dragon Quest II did everything a good sequel should, and if I had to sum up its improvements in one word, it would be expansion. It expanded and refined the gameplay, hugely expanded the world map, and expanded the lore a bit. The opening was a slog, Malroth's original power terrifies me, and the cave to Renderak can die in a fire, but the sheer differences in scope between the first game and the second is an accomplishment worth lauding, and Dragon Quest was far from content to leave it at that. Dragon Quest III is widely regarded as the best of the trilogy, and next time, We'll see exactly why that is. Join me on the final leg of this journey as we take a look at Dragon Quest III, The Seeds of Salvation. Later, everyone!